Okay. Oh, this is ready. All right. File. New. Okay. All right. All right. Let me just write the example. And this is kinematic synthesis of three topologies. This is what we are doing. And when we say three topologies, we mean any topology. Okay, this is the most general case. And now we are going to start. Today we are going to continue with the example that we started and based on that example we will continue developing the theory. Uh, as I said, when we talk about three topologies we are talking about any serial topology. So we are going to, for right now, uh, skip the, the those topologies that have loops, okay? Closed linkages, parallel robots. But serial chains are included here. You know, it's a case in which you only have one branch, right? That's a serial chain. So this you can, if you need a reference for this, there's a paper, right? It's called Kinematic Synthesis of Three Topologies. And it's from Mechanism and Machine Theory. Mechanism and Machine Theory. And I believe that it will be out January 2014. That's the date of publication. But I'll I'll, I'll post our draft in 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 our Moodle page, and then you can follow what we are doing. Because in our notes, this hasn't been passed to the notes yet. Okay. All right. So let me just put here the example that we were doing last time. We had this. This is already a contracted graph. We had the root. We have a 2R serial chain here. Then we had a 3R finger here. We had an R. And then we had three more fingers here. 2R. 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 All right. So in this hand, we kind of have. Uh, it's kind of similar to our hand if we had more mobility at the carpal level. Right. So you have a finger that is kind of independent, and then you have three fingers that move. You know, uh, with one one more common joint. All right. And what we had done for this one, we had identified. We have four branches, right? And I think we call this one, branch one. Uh, let me see if I have it here. Two, three. Uh, as the other three are the same uh, one, let's just put, I don't know if we did this or we did the opposite. So this is branches. B equal four. And, you know, we had learned how to do the contraction already, so that, you know, it's just eliminating the serial chains. And we had written the kinematics equations for a couple of branches. Remember we said when you have several branches, you just write a forward kinematics equation for each branch because you know the forward kinematics will relate your uh, your root to your end effector. So if you have four end effectors, you need four forward kinematics equation, right? So we had written those and we had shown how is the notation for those. So Q1 of delta theta. And then we do the exponentials. And now we know, remember, this was what prompted us to study the product of exponentials. Screw rotation about each of the axes. Uh, delta theta 1 over 2 S1. Delta theta 2 over 2 S2. These are the common joints. Now we had this notation that we said branch and then joint, right? And we continue from here. So the exponential of delta theta branch 1, join 3, 1, 3, over 2, S1, 3, 
exponential delta theta branch 1 branch 2 s4 it's 3 so we have one more sorry there's one more exponential here delta theta 1 5 over 2 s1 5 sorry I forgot the one here s1 4 s1 5 okay so that allows you to calculate how many joints you have in a branch and also you know name the, the joints according to the branch in which they live so these are the relative forward kinematics for branch one from a reference configuration to all the possible other configurations we did this for branch one and for, for branch two and now now we know that this S1 this joint axis is an element of the Lie algebra when we do the exponential of that you get a, di a displacement and if you give values to this theta then you get a subgroup you know which is the subgroup of rotations about this axis okay so this is a screw displacement another screw displacement and so on right let me let me just put branch two we don't have to put all of them but having one and two helps to understand the notation q2 of delta theta so these two are common and but this one is also common so this one will be r3 okay e delta theta 1 over 2 s1 e delta theta 2 over 2 s2 e delta theta 3 over 2 s3 and now we take these two which are for branch 2 so exponential of delta theta branch 2 joint 4 exactly over 2 s2 4 and again we cannot fit that exponential of delta theta 2 5 s2 5 okay so that will be the motion from the reference configuration of second finger to any other motion and you know for simplicity we are considering that all the fingers you know uh, have the same time time stamp okay so you know the first position for all the fingers will be the same then they all move to the second position if one doesn't move then the second position is the same as, as the first but okay we are counting this you know a simultaneous motion of all the end effectors okay otherwise things become a little bit more complex so branch two and then we can do the same for branch three and branch four and that's where we stopped last day i believe no actually i think we did a little bit of the counting right we said okay these are the forward kinematics now what kind of task can we design for this hand right and we started talking about that i'm not sure if we did all right so let us assume that we did not and we'll talk in general about counting okay so given given the topology oh, and I don't know how to denote this one okay so we have two two and then we have the first branch is three three and then we have one two 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 I don't know it's the first time I write this is this understandable so this this one has two branches right one with three and one with one and then this the one with one has three branches each of them with two yeah we agree okay let me just put the drawing here okay two r three r r two r to R and you know this is research being developed in front of your eyes so if you don't like this notation this is the moment to change it okay such as other notation so two common joints and then it splits in two branches so that means splitting mm -hmm. one branch has three and the, the other branch has one that splits in three branches with two do we like that mm -hmm. do we want something different so two R means 
this is, this is already compacted. So the original graph, let's we can rem remember that. The original graph was like R R yeah. So all the serial chains we have al already eliminated, and then we had here we had three. So one, two, three, and then that was the end effector. And now we have to, you know, in this case, if if it's if it's degree one, it's an end effector. In general, it doesn't have to be. So R R R, and then here we had another R. Uh, no three R. That's sorry. I'm I'm putting one extra R here. R. R, 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 2R. No, I put one extra. Okay, let me start. Oh, R, R. Okay, no, it was right. Hey, I'm looking at the contract. Okay, now we have three. Let me just put one, two, three, right? One, two, three. And now from this R, R, now we have one more R. And now we split into three different ones. So one, two, one, two. One, two, okay, and all of them are R, 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 R. So this is this is the kinematic sketch of our hand, okay, and this is the compacted one. So so far we have this notation, and the bar means splitting, right? So given the topology that, and when you see that, let's do an example. Let's just put it. Let's see if we can, yes, let's see. Two, four, comma, four, comma, one, three, comma, one, comma, two, comma, two. One, all right. Let's see if we can draw that. I ha do I have a volunteer to draw that in the, in the board? <laughs> or I can draw it for you, so. Two R. Two R. Let's let's make it uh, compacted already, right? And then one, two, three splits, right? One, two, three. One is a four, right? Four R. Let's assume these are four R. Four R. And then one. No, it splits into two parts. Three R. Okay. One is three R. Now one will split into two more. And then this splits into more. more. This is one R, right? Yeah. And then two, two R and two R. Okay, so it seems that it's understandable, right? We can recover our structure. All right, good. <laughs> I like it. Okay, don't let me get too happy about that. Okay, so given the topology, how many simultaneous positions of all the end effectors can we define to do the exact synthesis? And we always solve the exact synthesis problem first because that gives us some insight on the problem. You can always optimize later and do you know as many positions as you want, but you know the exact synthesis gives you you know the idea of can this reach big tasks or are we really very limited with this? Are we working on a subspace or are we working in the whole space? And, you know things like that. So that's why. We want to answer, given the topology, how many, many arbitrary positions can we define can we define uh, for exact synthesis? And this is a question that has been you know, going on for many years. This is an open research. Uh, it's a topic where there, are, there is a lot of material being done. We don't have a general formula yet, but let me remind you first the typical formula that we use for si simple systems, not for, you know, just the ones that you would learn in a kinematics class or you would use to do quick calculations. And that I think we talked about that, that's the Kutzbrack or the Chebyshev Kutzbrack Grebler formula. Chef Kutz Grebler. Uh, 
with this we compute the mobility this is not the formula for for the exact synthesis but you know knowing the mobility of the, your system is the basic stone in order to see how many positions you need to compute so the Chevy said cuts back Robler formula gives you the mobility mobility of your system and uh, we already have this formula right we have lambda n minus 1 minus the sum i equal 1 to j of uh, lambda minus f i okay where n is equal to the number of links of your system j is equal to the number of joints f sub i are the degrees of freedom of your joint so how many mo how many different types of motions your joint allows degrees of freedom of joint i and lambda defines the space in which your motion takes place okay space in which motion takes place so this formula is thought more for closed systems for parallel robots for closed linkages because that's where things become complicated for serial uh, chains it's it's fairly simple and uh, it becomes a little bit more complicated when we are talking about synthesis just for analysis and you if you just have an open system a seri open serial chain then this is this is very straightforward um, this lambda usually is just taken as either three or six so you may have a planar motion or you may have lambda equal to six for a spatial motion and of course there are other cases but these are the typical ones okay so you can do this quick counting but this doesn't cover all the cases for synthesis before we decide how many positions we can reach with our you know tree system we are taking a strategy here that may or may not be the right one I mean it works but it may not be the most general case what we are doing is we are taking our loops and we are converting those to serial chains okay. uh, we perform and we need to do that before we count what we call reduction okay which is convert loops into equivalent and here is the key serial chains convert loops into equivalent serial chains So basically what we do is if you have two branches going to the same point creating a loop we look at what happens with this branch with what happens with this branch is there one that is more restrictive than the other if there is one that is more restrictive we just skip that one and completely eliminate the other one okay if both have the same level of restriction and they are general then we again eliminate one use another one because both will have the same kind of motion but sometimes these two branches when they combine they because of their spe special geometry they actually work in a different space than you know a general generally oriented uh, chain and those cases are the ones that we need to look at so let me just write that somehow so look at look at branches coinciding 
at an end effector. So we look at the different branches. So here we are coming from uh, root and uh, maybe we have, let me just do the, the uh, compacted graph, so maybe we have a 2R and then we have a 3R. Maybe that's not the best example. Um, let me just make them a little bit bigger, <laughs> otherwise we'll be in trouble for other reasons. So here we have a 3R and here we have a 4R. So that's okay. And here is our end effector. Well, first we should look at if this system is able to move or not. You know, uh, does it move? Yes, generally oriented, 3R and, and 4R. We can do the mobility. We can use that equation over here and look at the mobility. This is another quick way of looking at it is if it has 3R, then it means it has 3 degrees of freedom, so it's restricting 3 degrees of freedom in this side. If it has 4R, then it has 4 degrees of freedom, it's restricting 2 degrees of freedom, so 3 and 2 is 5, still can move with 1 degree of freedom. It's looking at, it's a quick counting that, uh, so we assume it can move, right? And uh, you know, for synthesis purpose, we, we look at which one is going to be more restrictive. So in this case, we look at, you know, this 3R, and then we look at the 4R, and of course the 3R is going to be more restrictive, right? So whatever this, this chain can move, we are hypothesizing that this 3R is going to be the one that, you know, kind of uh, restricts the motion. So what we do is we eliminate the 4R, and we do the synthesis for the 3R. That's kind of risky because, you know, this this is going to limit also how this one moves, right? So... Yes, mm -hmm. yes, exactly. You're saying, okay, this is going to be more restrictive because it's only three joints, this is four, so this, you know, this is going to just, you know, from a synthesis point of view, you cannot define more positions than what the three R has, right? Because otherwise this branch won't be able to do it. So this branch will have one infinity of, of solutions if we define. So let's say for the 3R you just need to define five positions and for the 4R is nine for doing the exact synthesis. So we cannot define more than five positions for this. Otherwise this branch won't be able to follow. So this one for five positions this will have infinite solutions. So we solve for that and then you know we add this afterwards. Does that make sense? Let me just write it down. So for this one, n max or m max is equal to five. If we define more than five positions, we cannot hit those exactly. And uh, we have a formula for calculating that. We will work that out. For this one, m max is equal to nine positions. Which means if we define five positions for a four R, you know, there are infinite infinitely many for our chains that can reach five positions exactly, okay? So we say, okay, we eliminate that and we solve for that. What is the catch here? Well, maybe this motion is restricted. It's more restricted than the three R only, okay? Because of the restrictions that this one imposes, right? In that case, that wouldn't be a good strategy. And that's why first we need to look at what is the space in which this whole loop moves before we do that, okay? We haven't done a lot of practice with this method. In fact, we haven't done any, <laughs> okay? So this is one of the things that we need to test and see if this is a good way of going or if we are completely wrong. Unfortunately, our paper is already published, so if it's wrong, then we'll be ashamed for life. But, uh, okay, so this is what we do. We so the problem with problem we are facing here? So the problem we are facing is that for, for the purpose of uh, synthesis, we only want to have 
serial chains, we don't want loops. Okay. Because our strategy of, of using the forward kinematics equation that's designed for serial chains. Mm -hmm. So so that so what we are saying is how do we eliminate these loops or what do we do with them, you know? How do we deal with loops when we are trying to do synthesis? That's an open problem for research, okay? So this is one method. It's like, okay, if you have two that uh, one is dominating the motion in the sense that it's more restrictive, eliminate the other one and solve for that. The one which is restrictive, we have to keep that. Yes, exactly. Because, uh, you know, if you try to design for nine positions, this won't be able to reach it because it can only reach up to five. Okay? But, uh, you know, that assumes that, you know, this 3R will be able to do the same as it does when it's alone, you know, and it's just a 3R, okay? It's, uh, it, it works for some cases, I still don't know why, okay? Because, you know, we, we have tested with the 2R. Same thing is true when you have 2R and 2R, for instance, and in this case we are talking about a very specific geometry, okay? In general it doesn't work. You know, that if you look at the 2R, it can reach you know, a, a bigger workspace than the close linkage, right? So basically, if, if we are talking, and this is a special case, uh, chun chun chun. Uh, no. It's going to go up here. Okay. So this is a 4R four, a four in space. If you just look at two of these, you know, they can reach a, a whole, you know, plane, you know, a plane, you know, a to, to the surface. When you join them together, they can only reach a certain trajectory, a, a one-dimensional. However, this problem can be solved by just looking at that, and it gives you the solution for both of them. Don't ask me why, I still don't understand this. So the way we solve this is exactly this. You know, we take just one, solve, solve for it, and in fact, you know, the other one actually is it's a, another solution. So in this case, you have infinite solutions and then you just can just add it afterwards. In this case, it turns out that if you solve for this, you get this, you know, as a bonus. You get all the possible chains that can go through those positions. For synthesis purpose, if you just do the synthesis for one leg, you get all the legs. And, that's, and the th funny thing is that's the maximum that y they can do. And I'm not sure why that happens, but it does happen in oh. some cases. I'm saying it works in all the cases, but I don't know. I know it works in some cases. So this is the way we simplify the problem for right now, but you know, testing it will give us more, more insight on whether this is right or not. Right now we are just eliminating one branch, solving for the other. Um, but then we have to look at special geometries. So let me just show you an example. We have to be careful with with spatial geometries. So for instance, we have an example here, which is a Saros linkage. And maybe we'll find one. I don't know if I show you this linkage already when we did the... Um, let me just copy. So imagine that we have a, a tree topology that has a Saros linkage. For instance, we have a P, we have an R, this is not uh, compacted. We have an R, and here we have one end defector. That's a normal one, and then we have this system. So we have three R, 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 and another three R. R, 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 R. R, and here we have another vector, so we have a loop here, okay? But this over here is not just a, you know, an arbitrary 3R, this is a Saros. Which means that these three joints are parallel, R, 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 and these three joints are parallel at 90 degrees. Let me see if I can show you one of those in, in here, there. Oh, there it is. Okay, so this is a Saros linkage, and you have one, two, three parallel joints here, revolute joints, and then you have one, two, and three parallel <coughs> joints at 90 degrees. So, 
the motion of this, this is a close linkage, and the motion of this is only a translation in the axis which is perpendicular to both. And that's, you know, it's a close linkage with a specific geometry to obtain exactly this motion. Okay? So we can we can just take yes go ahead. If only one we take only one of them, it will give the same result as in all of them. No, because then it can move in the plane. You see, it can. You cannot go only up and down, no, but if, uh, if all the parallels, for example, how yeah. many parallel are in three. So if if you just take one of the branches, then it can move. You know, in in you know kind of in a plane, right? But when you join the two branches, then the, the workspace is restricted. It moves in just one single direction. It means uh, we cannot eliminate. We cannot eliminate it happily because this is restricting the motion of that one, and uh, we need to take that into account. So you know, we need a, a smart formula so that we can. Let me just close this. Otherwise, it's going to be yes. We need a smart formula so that we can convert this into what it really is, which, you know, when we do the reduction, what we want to obtain is, well, first of all, let's compact it to, so PR, and then we'll have R, and then we'll have P. That is what we want to an obtain at the end. Because okay. this is really equivalent to a prismatic joint. So in this case, we don't want to keep an RRR chain as, as the reduce we want to transform that to a p okay that would be the, the correct reduction in this case so specific geometries it's a problem and it's a problem that we need to solve somehow the, uh, previous example is uh, same as here two 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 r uh, chain oh the two oh, previous example let me just go to the previous example the two r well, in this in this case, no. Actually, the motion here is not on, on this. This is a motion. It's a one-dimensional motion, but it's on the whole space. So you can actually define. You know, in that case, for synthesis, you couldn't define the same number of positions as for the three R parallel chain. In this case, you can actually define uh, the same as for one single chain. And the, we are talking about a specific geometry here. Okay, this is also a specific case, but. Uh, in this case, the geometry is derived from the solutions. In the other case, you cannot do that. Okay. So this, and this is what we are going to study. Okay, this is restricted, but the motion really is not restricted. It can happen in the whole space. The other one is restricted, and it restricts us also where the motion happens. How do we, ac how do we account for that? I don't know if that, I can explain this very well. Okay, because you have to think from synthesis purpose, you have to think not only on this particular trajectory, but where this trajectory could be, and it could be anywhere. Okay, you could have defined the position instead of here, you could have defined three arbitrary positions here, and you will still get one linkage. However, for the Saros, if you define three arbitrary positions, it won't solve the it won't solve right. It won't give you the motion on one single, uh, you know, subspace of dimension one. It's. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that with with examples we will arrive to understand what this means because it is it is not very easy. Okay. So what we cannot do in this case we cannot do is this. Pr. R. 3R. Okay, we cannot do that because that is going to have more motion than this. We, ne we and then you know we are not solving this problem. The right substitution is with a P joint. Yes, exactly. And the P could be you know it could be located anywhere, where, depending on where these axes are oriented. But it will always be in one single direction. If you take a 3R here, even if it's with parallel joints, then you have a much bigger motion. Basically, we have to first look at how the mechanism works and then just Yeah, but you know our mechanisms, because we are doing synthesis, they could be anywhere. It's not like analysis that you have this mechanism here and you can see. You know, this actually could be anywhere in space and that <coughs> makes it a little bit harder. Anyway, 
So this this reduction business that was supposed to simplify our lives actually uh, it's giving us a lot of a lot of trouble. So if you try to do this for the for the if you try to use the Chebyshev Katzberg Katzberg Grebler formula for for the Saros linkage, uh, it's not going to work. Okay, because we cannot. We cannot uh, in the in this formula we cannot assume a specific geometry. So if you can count the joints and you get three joints here, you will get a lot of freedom. Okay. Doesn't work. In this case, this is one of those cases that can be solved using screw theory. Okay. This case is clear, but then cases like the Bennett linkage they cannot be. Cannot be. You did it that. Uh, yeah, for that wide process, uh, what, uh, from the range. Yeah, exactly. And we are going to do something similar now. So we are going to look at what are the directions of the velocity. And then those directions of velocity, they create a subspace of velocities. And then when you intersect this subspace of velocities with this subspace of velocities, what is your, inter your intersection going to be? That's going to be your the space in which you will move. Okay. So for instance, in this case, this could be solved using screw theory. So if you have a joint, if you have three joints like this, you know, parallel, then you have uh, this plane of velocities. Let me see. So it's in this, you know, this plane of velocities. OK? I'm, I'm trying to do this perpendicular to this joint, OK? Right? And then you will have another one perpendicular that will give you this plane of velocities. <laughs> And the intersection is just the is just the z direction, okay? And that's you know when you join two two branches, you are intersecting. You know this. You know the total the motion of the hole will be the motion of that. You know the the directions in which this can move and this can move. So it's an intersection. So some problems can be solved with uh, screw theory, and in fact that's what we are going to do. But for synthesis, it's a little bit more involved because. Now your axes are not here. It could be here, or it could be here, or here, or here, because it's synthesis, right? So that's why we are going to define something new. It's called, and again, you can very heavily criticize this because this is all things that we haven't tested properly, OK? So if you can think of a better solution, we will take it. This is what we call the linkage locus space. So let me just go back and you remember what the workspace is, okay? Workspace. Workspace, remember we said it's not a set of points, it's a set of displacements. The set of displacements that your end effector can perform. So we can write the workspace W equal to the set of displacements such that they come from your product of exponentials of your kinematic chain. Theta i over 2 or if you want delta theta over si uh, equal to uh, equal to omega, okay? For all delta theta i, okay? And then this is for an n jointed serial chain, right? We can define the workspace as all the displacements that come from the motion of your chain, basically for an n jointed chain. All right. Okay. Now we know that for a single joint, if you compute the workspace of a single joint, the set of displacements, that is going to be a subgroup of displacements. We know that, we know it, because we studied the other day, you know, the Lie algebra, and we said, you know, it's a one parameter subgroup, right? We know that for a single joint, the workspace, which will be equal to 
the displacement such that they are e to the delta theta divided by 2s equal to w for all the values of delta theta where w is a subspace a subspace a uh, subgroup sorry it's always a subspace okay. it's a subgroup no it's not always a subspace <laughs> okay it's a subgroup of the whole group of rigid motions okay if you have a revolute joint if you have a, a joint axis that's the s and you have a yes rotations you will create the subgroup of rotations about an axis and if you go back to chapter three of the notes which are posted in our model page there you have listed all the subgroups of the group of special of uh, uh, rigid motion and you know the rotation about one axis is one of those subgroups which means you know if you give values to your theta you will get another motion which is a rotation and if you compose two of those motions you will get another motion that is a rotation about the same axis so it's closed in itself for a single joint is a subgroup in general the workspace is not a subgroup you probably know that it's just a chunk uh, um, a subset of your of your set of motions which we know is a manifold of dimension six right because it's a Lie group <laughs> okay in general general is not subgroup it is a subset this is a little bit annoying because if we are dealing with subgroups then it's really easy for us to compute the dimension so the dimension in which our system will move and you know, if it's a subgroup we know the dimension of, of all the subgroups of the group of rigid motion so it will be very easy but in general it is not and uh, in fact you know you can prove that you know, it, when you have this kind of product, let me just say, uh, proof that the exponential of, uh, let me just say, in general, and this being an element of the Lie algebra, this is different from the exponential of x plus y. Okay. We cannot reduce that to the sum as we would do with uh, elements unless they commute. Okay? E x e y equal to e x plus y only if they commute on the Lie bracket. Okay, so you can create a single exponent and then a subgroup only if they commute. Now we are lost again, right? What does it mean for us that they commute? What is this, right? Let's go back to the Lie algebra once more. You can prove that. So you guys can do it. If you want, we will give you, we'll give you this as a homework, <laughs> if you want. It's very easy, just expand the Taylor series expansion using the Lie bracket and then you will see that in order to get that you, you need to add uh, you know, this plus that to make twice this in order to you know, make the square. So it's really easy to see that. There is a formula, it is a general formula but it's, it's an open formula. It's, it's pretty complicated. Baker, Campbell, Hausdorff. Baker, Campbell. Now with this you can really impress your friends, okay? You say, I would say, what are you thinking about? Oh, I'm, I'm thinking about the Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff function to compose exponentials in a Lie algebra. And then you you will lose all your friends quickly. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, so there is a formula for this. This is actually the exponential of something. It's an open formula, it's a complicated formula. Okay. I'm going to copy it because I don't know the, the numbers in the coefficients and hopefully I have it here. Uh, yeah. <coughs> okay. 
So this is x plus y plus a lot of products. One half of xy plus one over twelve x x xy. So you keep doing lip products because they don't plus y y x. Plus, and there are terms and terms and terms, and there is no, as far as I know, there is no closed uh, expression for this formula. There's a lot of research in the math, uh, there may be something, but you know, it keeps adding terms because you know, every time you, you do the Lie bracket of this, you may get something different. And then, if you want to close it and create a subalgebra, then you need to see how this multiplies with the other terms and that has to be included in your subalgebra. So you have to keep adding and adding and adding and adding and it never ends, you know, in general. If you have specific geometries then it may. So in general it's not a subspace. Okay. Uh, sorry, a, a subgroup when we, when we do these exponentials, okay. We know that it is for individual joints for some particular cases it is when they commute. Let's look at that. That's what we were going to look at and it's almost time, right? Oh, we haven't even done half of the... Anyway, we, haven't, we don't even know what's the linkage locus space yet. Let's look at the Lie algebra, which is the tangent plane of the Lie group of the rigid motions. Let's look at this one, okay? So here you have SE3. Remember, it's six-dimensional, it's not 2D as I... And here is the tangent plane at the uh, identity element, little s e3. Remember, here is where all our velocities live, and the velocities are the same as our screws for us, right? Okay, so let's look at that one. Dimension six, and this one has to have the same dimension because it's the tangent plane, right? So we can, you know, this is an algebra, hence it's a vector space, so we can create a basis for this. Let's talk about the basis. Anyway, this is, I have a chapter which is I already uploaded that has this also. Eh? Chapter 4 has the basis for the algebra, so basis of S E3. So we have six vectors, and the easiest one is to take, remember that a general, a general vector here will be a velocity, and remember that we call that a twist. A general element will have the angular velocity of the body that is moving, and then the linear velocity of a point, and that's all that you need to compute the velocity of every point in the body. Six dimensional vectors. So we can take, as the basis, we can take this one, zero, 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 zero. zero. This is an angular velocity about the i axis, the x axis, right? Omega j, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Now we are going to take Lie brackets with these elements. Omega k, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. So these three will define the three uh, all possible angular velocity vectors and also all possible directions of our screw axis, right? Vi, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. Vj, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. Vk, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay, this is our basis. Now let us take the Lie bracket of this and see what happens. Well, let me just tell you that these are our bases as 60 vectors. We can write them in the dual quaternion algebra, in the Clifford algebra, we can write them as matrices. Let me, let me give you the, the, the expression of, as matrices. You know, you can express them in any algebra. So basically when we see that six so this one is the velocity, and that's the angular velocity, and this is the linear velocity of a point. And uh, you can think of this as also as the screw axis. So, you know, physically this is the space of velocities. When, as we are dealing with uh, with uh, finite motion, we do this assumption. 
you know the motion about this axis from this point to this point is the same as if we you know this is the smallest motion that we can perform so if your velocity is constant and it's in this direction you will move from here to there and in reality you may have done all this but the smallest motion is the one in which our screw axis coincides with the direction of the velocity and that one is constant okay so this omega is the angular velocity Do we are talking about velocities of rigid bodies here not velocities of points and I don't want to go in velocities too much, but uh, it's kind of hard to do that if uh, if we deal with with Lie algebras. Linear velocity of a point in the body. Any point is fine. Once you know a point and you know the angular velocity, you can calculate the velocity of any other point of the body, right? Okay. At the same time. You can think of this as this omega, this vector over here, let me put arrows on them, is equal to a certain magnitude m, or let me just call it theta dot times s. And then s is the rotation axis. Okay, so this defines both the angular velocity and the rotation axis, which is the one that we use. And similarly, from these ones, we can ex extract our moment of our, our of our axis. Okay, it's a little bit. Uh, this one is is very straightforward. The other one is too, but there is a change of sign with uh, the typical notation that is used. So we will do that when we do velocities. Okay, but think of this as the basis for. So this is the basis for velocities for rigid body velocities but you can think of this also as the basis for for screw axis screw axis lines screws okay the space of lines in the space with a certain pitch all right so this is the basis which means any element of the algebra can be created as a linear combination of this times a constant, right? Let us do the Lie bracket of, oh no, I was going to tell you the expression as matrices. Expression as matrices. For instance, let's just take, let's just take a couple of those so that you can see. So, for instance, omega i the rotation in the x direction uh, well I know how that is right uh, we can express it as a matrix and when it's a matrix we will just call it big omega i and what we have to do is just to create the skew symmetric matrix with one in the x so 0 0 0 0 0 minus 1 0 minus 1 0 and if we are talking about the whole space where all the velocities have to be included there too, we can add one more line. <coughs> zero, 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 zero. Okay? So that, this and this are the same thing. Just expressed in different notations, in different algebra. We can th we can also use the the um, the calculus of dual vectors, right? We could express also omega i as 1, 0, 0 plus epsilon 0, 0, 0, okay? So we can also use dual vectors and then use dual vector calculus. Three expressions of the same thing, okay? This, this, and that. Why do we need these expressions? Because now we are going to apply the Lie bracket and you can select, you know, you can pick whatever, where, where you want to use the Lie bracket. So, now let's do the Lie bracket of some of those. So we are, right now we are looking at how the, 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 the Lie algebra of, of our group of displacement is behaving, okay? And we will see why we want to do that later. So what is omega i Lie bracket with omega i? You, if you want, you can try to multiply this matrix. You are going to get zero because the Lie bracket is a skew symmetric product. 
which means that this has to be equal to minus this, which means it's going to be zero. Okay, so this is the same thing for omega j, the same thing for omega k, and the same thing for the velocities, okay? Equal to, you know, vi, comma vi, and so on. Okay. All right, so let's do other more interesting Lie brackets. Omega i, Lie bracket with omega j. What do we get here? And we have to multiply. You, I think you get omega k. I don't quite remember, but I think that's what So omega j, omega k equal to omega i. Let me make sure I have this right. jk is i and then ki is j. Omega k. So look at this. This is interesting because no, the, 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 uh, the directions, the angular velocities or the, or, the, or the rotation axis, the directions, they multiply together and they stay together, okay? They don't mix with the, with the other three, with the vi, vj, vk, but we will see that this is not the case for the v's. So now let's compute, for instance, omega i comma vi. I, oh, I didn't give you any matrix for that one. Let me just give you the matrix here. Uh, maybe here. Vi as a matrix is 0, 0, 0, 0. So the rotation part is all zeros. And then we have Vi is 1, 0, 0, 0. This one is big Vi, okay, as a matrix. So this one is the same as this vector over here. Okay? So you multiply omega i times Vi. We could do it, but we don't have time, so we get actually zero. And this is the same for omega j, vj, omega k, vk. Let me just do the rest of the products. So what are we missing? We are missing the mixed omegas and v's that don't have the same need to compute them right here. Omega i, vk is equal to minus vj, omega j, Vi minus Vk and omega k Vj equal to minus Vi. Okay, so with that we have the whole set of <coughs> multiplications. And let me just uh, so now you have this, and, and you know any vector will be a linear combination of that and a linear combination of this product. So when you have a direction and you combine that with the moment part, which is the vis for us, you get again the moment. Okay. So we have seen that you know with the product of exponentials, where we are trying to go from the Lie algebra, from the directions of the axis, to the motion. You no. Know, we can actually combine those exponentials if, they, if the elements of the Lie algebra commute. And which elements of the Lie algebra are going to commute? Are the ones that have zero in the Lie bracket. So the elements that commute are the elements that when you do the Lie bracket in the Lie bracket is zero because you know the, the Lie bracket has that this property, right? So commuting. In general, we have that x y is equal to minus y x. So the only way that this is going to be true is if it's it's equal to zero. Then x y equal to zero. Then that will be equal to y x. Okay. So here you see where we can actually compose displacements and get subgroups. It is going to be when we compose, uh, oh, we are missing one case here. The Vj's, uh, all the Vi, Vj's, they also give zero, okay? So when you compose just translations, you can get a subgroup. When you compose motions that, you know, you have a rotation and a translation in the same direction. Okay. 
and of course when you have two that coincide on the same axis, right? So we will see next day some of the cases in which you can actually create a subspace directly. Mac are hunt and this is from the International Journal of Robotics Research uh, 1991 okay yeah okay this thing has been around for a while uh, and people use it a lot for analyzing but not many people work in synthesis so that's why you know we need to develop this for synthesis from scratch okay Hans' book is very good. If you can get a hold of that, let me know. I want a copy.